Let us go, Basil, said Lord Henry, and the two young men went away. A few moments afterwards, the curtain rose on the third act. Dorian Gray went back to his seat. He looked pale and indifferent. The play went on. Half of the audience went out laughing. The whole thing was a failure. The last act was played to almost empty benches. At last the curtain went down. As soon as it was over, Dorian Gray went to see Sybil. The girl was standing there alone, with a look of triumph on her face. Her eyes were lit with a fire. Her lips were smiling over some secret of their own. When he entered, she looked at him, and an expression of infinite joy came over her. How badly I acted tonight, Dorian, she cried. Horribly, he answered. Horribly, it was dreadful. Are you ill? The girl smiled. Dorian, you should have understood. But you understand now, don't you? Understand what? he asked angrily. Why I was so bad tonight? Why I shall always be bad? Why I shall never act well again? You are ill, I suppose. When you are ill, you shouldn't act. You make yourself ridiculous. My friends were bored. I was bored. She seemed not to listen to him. Dorian! Dorian, she cried, before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. It was only in the theater that I lived. I thought that it was all true. I was Rosalind one night, and Portia the other. I believed in everything. The common people who acted with me seemed to me to be godlike. The painted scenes were my world. I knew nothing but shadows, and I thought them real. You came, O oh my beautiful love, and you freed my soul from prison. You taught me what reality really is. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I saw that the Romeo was ugly and old and painted, that the moonlight in the garden was false, that the scenery was dreadful, and that the words were unreal. They were not my words, were not the words what I wanted to say. You had brought me something higher. Now I could see that all art is nothing but a reflection. You had made me understand what love really is. My love, my love, Prince Charming, Prince of Life, I have grown sick of shadows. You are more to me than all art can ever be. When I came on the stage tonight, I could not understand why everything had gone from me. I thought that I was going to be wonderful. I found that I could do nothing. What could they know of love, such as ours? Take me away, Dorian. Take me away with you, or we can be quite alone. I hate the stage. You have made me see that. He sat down on the sofa and turned away his face. You have killed my love he said. She looked at him in wonder and laughed. He made no answer. She came across to him, knelt down and pressed his hands to her lips. He drew them away. Then he stood up and went to the door. Yes, he cried, you have killed my love. I loved you because you had genius and intellect, because you realized the dreams of great poets and gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. You have thrown it all away. You were empty and stupid. My God, how mad I was to love you. What a fool I have been. You are nothing to me now. I will never see you again. I will never think of you. I will never mention your name. You don't know what you were to me once. Why, once? Oh, I wish I had never laid eyes upon you. You have spoiled the romance of my life. Without your art, you are nothing. 
The girl grew white and trembled. You are not serious, Dorian, she murmured. You are acting. Acting? I leave that to you, he answered. She rose from her knees, and with an expression of pain in her face, came across the room to him. She put her hand upon his arm and looked into his eyes. Don't touch me, he cried, and pushed her away. She fell on the floor and lay there like a trampled flower. Dorian, Dorian, don't leave me, she whispered. I am so sorry I didn't act well. I was thinking of you all the time. But I will try. Indeed, I will try. It came so suddenly across me, my love, for you. Don't go away from me. I couldn't bear it. Oh, don't go away from me. My brother... No, never mind. He didn't mean it. But you... Oh, can't you forgive me for tonight? I will work so hard and try to improve. I love you better than anything in the world. After all, it is only once that I have not pleased you. But you were quite right, Dorian. It was foolish of me. And yet I couldn't help it. Oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. But Dorian Gray, with his beautiful eyes, looked down at her and left the room. Sybil Vane seemed to him to be absurdly unnatural. Her tears annoyed him. In a few moments, he was out of the theater. Where he went to, he hardly knew. All night, he walked through the dark London streets. The ugly and terrible people frightened him in the dark. Early in the morning, in the warm sunshine, the world looked different. The air was heavy with the perfume of the flowers and their beauty seemed to bring him happiness. At last Dorian came home. He wanted to have a short rest in his bedroom, and was going through the library, towards the door of his bedroom. Suddenly his eye fell upon the portrait Basil Howard had painted of him. Then he went on into his own room, looking puzzled. Then he came back, went over to the picture, and examined it. There was something different about it, he thought. The face looked different. One would have said that there was a touch of cruelty in the mouth. It was certainly strange. He turned round and, walking to the window, drew up the curtain. The bright sunshine came into the room, but the strange expression that he had noticed in the face of the portrait was there. The sunlight showed him the lines of cruelty round the mouth as clearly as if he had been looking into a mirror after he had done some dreadful thing. He took from the table an oval mirror and looked at his own face. No line like that on his red lips. What did it mean? He rubbed his eyes and came close to the picture and examined it again. There were no signs of any change when he looked into the painting and yet there was no doubt that the whole expression had changed. He sat in the armchair and began to think. Suddenly he remembered what he had said in Basil Hallward's studio, the day the picture had been finished. Yes, he remembered it perfectly. He had said aloud a mad wish that he himself might remain young and the portrait grow old that his own beauty might last forever, and the face on the portrait bear the burden of his passions and his sins. But such things were impossible. It seemed monstrous even to think of them. And yet there was the picture before him, with the touch of cruelty in the mouth. Cruelty! Had he been cruel? It was the girl's fault not his. He had dreamed of her as a great artist, had given his love to her, because he had thought her great. Then she disappointed him, and yet the feeling of infinite regret came over him as he thought of her lying at his feet. 
Why is he made like that? Why is such a soul given to him? But he suffered too. During the three terrible hours that the play had lasted, he had lived centuries of pain. Why should he trouble about Sybil Vane? She was nothing to him now. But the picture, what can he say of that? It held the secret of his life and told his story. It had taught him to love his own beauty. Would it teach him to hate his own soul? The portrait was watching him with its beautiful face and its cruel smile. Its blue eyes met his own. A sense of infinite pity, not for himself, but for the painted image of himself, came over him. It had changed already and would change more. Its gold would turn into gray. Its red and white roses would die. For every sin. But he would not sin. The picture, changed or unchanged, would be to him the visible emblem of conscience. He would resist temptation. He would not see Lord Henry any more, would not listen to his poisonous theories. He would go back to Sybil Vane, marry her, try to love her again. Yes, it was his duty to do so. She suffered more than he did. Poor child! He had been selfish and cruel to her. They would be happy together. His life with her would be beautiful. He got up from his chair and looked at his portrait again. How horrible, he thought and he walked across to the window and opened it. He thought only of Sybil. His love came back to him. He repeated her name over and over again. The birds that were singing in the garden seemed to be telling the flowers about her.